so there's so instructional systems design or instructional design, which is nowadays being called learning experience design. Um, it, it can play out in a couple of different contexts. Uh, it could be an enterprise learning context. It can be in an educational learning context. And then there's personal learning too, because I want to learn fly fishery, fishing and I need to you know, figure that out. But mm -hmm. so there's the big difference between an enterprise learning context and an educational learning context is that in an enterprise, we know pretty much what the terminal performance is, what the uh, tasks to be performed are and what the output is. Now there's some variance in that because if you're, if you're processing a loan application and you have to accept it or reject it, you know, and that's the that's the terminal output. Um, and there's measures for an output and there's measures for the performance, the tasks, two types of tasks, behavioral tasks, which we can see, and cognitive tasks, the thinking tasks that we cannot see. Right. That's part of the difficulty for all of this. In the educational world, it sometimes seems arbitrary and sometimes is arbitrary in terms of what are the learning objectives? What do we want people to know or be able to do when we're done? You know, if you're studying history, do you really need to memorize those dates? Is there a, is there a, um, uh, is that a means to some other end? Well, mm -hmm. if you're going to with history and get a, a master's and a PhD in it, yeah. But otherwise, so, most people who exist in an in an educational realm um, have not had to do the analysis of what's the performance that I want. It's a thing. It's a matter of saying, "Here's what I want people to know." I can articulate learning objectives, and then I can back out a design, and then right. from the design back out developing so that I actually achieve, you know, people's ability to memorize things or to be able to do things. Right. And I think that's the probably the biggest challenge for teachers who are making this migration, because this is a big deal, as you've probably seen on LinkedIn and on Twitter and other. It, so this is this is going on quite a bit, you know, and I feel bad for for teachers because they should be some of our most valued citizens, yet they don't get paid and they don't get the respect and all the rest of the things. So you wonder what the heck is up with that. But right. six. Um, but um, so people making the transition may think that, OK, I've, I know how to create a lesson plan. Mm -hmm. I know how to articulate the objectives. I know how to design an instructional flow. I know mm -hmm. when practices, exercises and quizzes and tests and things like that. And that's all very important to the process. But right. that's part of instructional design in an addy like model. And, and an addy like model is the analysis, design, mm -hmm. development, implementation, and evaluation. Mm -hmm. so, so the design and development are things I think that are going to be more comfortable to most teachers making this migration. What's going to be missing is before design, what does analysis look like? How do you do it? How do you do it quickly and avoid what's forever been known as analysis paralysis? Mm -hmm. So this is 1979. People were whining and complaining about analysis paralysis. And it's because too many in the field did that way back then that clients and our management, our, our training and development management, now learning and development management, they didn't like us doing analysis because we took too long mm -hmm. and there was no value perceived in doing it. And I remember seeing people doing task analysis, just random lists of tasks, disconnected and not organized in any form or fashion. And mm -hmm. then I look at that and go, well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what they do. Those are the things that they do. And then, but then it never seemed to have an impact. Because if you look at tasks and you don't know, the tasks are there to produce something. What right. is that? Mm -hmm. So my thing is, you know, when you're when a client asks for uh, training on a certain task, I want to know what the output is. And I can get to that gently without seeming like I'm challenging them by mm -hmm. saying, great, what would the practice with feedback look like? 
they'd be doing these tasks and what would they produce? And then mm -hmm. they tell me. Um, some of the times the problems are, well, we're trying to train everybody in the company on that task or that behavior or that topic. And so the application of that knowledge or skill is very mm -hmm. clients then don't want to create 150 different you know, practice exercises so that everybody can do something that's authentic. And if you don't do something that's authentic, if you don't take what you're learning, mm -hmm. what you're doing, and apply it and get some feedback that shit reinforces what you're doing well and, 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 and critiques and, and changes what you're not doing so well, you, you won't get better and it won't mm -hmm. train to the job and and have a positive impact and if, and if you learn something really well in class but it wasn't authentic and you go out to the job and you try to apply it in the job well it's not actually the same and so people can struggle with that and mm -hmm. then with they tend to revert to doing it how they used to do it now if you're brand new new hire and you've never done it some older way other way then you struggle and when you when you see things such as there's a, a reference model called the 70 20 10 saying mm -hmm. one of the things that are learned are informal learning and 20 percent is social and 10 percent is formal learning mm -hmm. well most formal learning that the field has produced since long before i got in it is garbage and so it doesn't teach people how to do their jobs and so therefore they've got to ask their neighbor socially and mm -hmm. then a trial and error learning and trying to figure it out themselves, which is informal. And I think that's number 70% or so is uh, so high because, and it's not that, you know, uh, low stakes performance, we shouldn't let people figure it out on their own and learn by trial and error. That's okay. But if there's risks or rewards at stake that are significant, then we shouldn't do that. So, so, so I think what you need to learn and you bought, the, my book, uh, Conducting uh, Performance-Based Instructional Analysis. Yes, I just got it in the mail. <laughs> oh, okay. That's all right. That's the that's the mini book. Okay. And, yeah. So, um, and so there's a there's um, so I, I cranked out a bunch of those here recently. So, what? So learning how to do the analysis and focus on performance first. Mm -hmm. What are outputs produced? How are they measured? How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the tasks that are performed? Um, what are the behavioral tasks that we can see and observe if we were watching somebody do something? Mm -hmm. But what are you thinking? Now, getting that out and eliciting that, that's kind of tough. I've got a, a separate book on, on all of that. Um, and, and, then and then, so there's looking at perfor performance is one of four types of analysis, and you'll see this in the book. There's the target audience. Who are they? What's their title or titles? So who, what's, you know, who are we trying to affect with this? And then what can we safely assume about them? Um, are they all going to have the same job or are some people going to do part of the job and other people are going to do a different part of the job? There's going to be people who are, are the only one in an office and they're going to do the whole thing. Right. So how does that vary the job assignments that we expect people in the target audience to do? We need to understand that variance because that'll help us modularize our content so people can cherry pick and get exactly what they need and skip the rest instead of putting it all in one big box. Right. Um, and then, then we need to understand, well, where are they coming from? Are we hiring all degreed engineers? So if they need to know about AC, DC, electrical theory, we're pretty assured that they already know that because they couldn't get through the college and get a degree with it. So so, so what education, what knowledge and skills, prior knowledge might they have because mm -hmm. of education and or experience? Maybe mm -hmm. we're getting all these new people from a different part of the company and we can know, oh, they already know how to log in onto the computer system and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. So that's important to understand the target audience, mm -hmm. make safe assumptions um, and, you know, um, so we can ask, you know, are there going to be people who are blind doing this work? Do we have to accommodate that with our instruction? Yes mm -hmm. or no, sir. And so that we need to have a fairly full understanding of the target audience. And nowadays, people talk about creating personas. And we're going to create a persona of, you know, four or five different kinds of people, the typical learners of which there's no such thing, but trying to represent 
you know, who the target audience is so we can understand the variances in that. And sometimes those persona things are done well and other times they're not. Mm -hmm. Part of analysis is the performance that I was talking about, the outputs, the measures, the tasks, their measures, mm -hmm. um, and, and understanding. So what are the current state gaps? What are people in the job right now doing that they're struggling with? Because that suggests that that part of our instruction, our training, our learning needs to be beefed up. That's mm -hmm. the part to learn. And if other people out there on the job are still struggling with that, then we're going to have to give that additional consideration and additional time and attention. Right. Once we understand the performance, then we can begin to understand, well, what are the knowledge and skills that are required? And you'll see this in the book. I have seven mm -hmm. categories of enabling knowledge and skills. Okay. So they automatically figure out, you know, what are the laws and regulations and codes that you need to know about? Or the policies and procedures, or the tools and equipment, or the internal and external resources that you have to call on to help you get the job done, or the interpersonal skills, or the computer tools, or right. a lot of things that you might need to know about right. to be able to perform. And then the last part of my analysis, approach to analysis, is so what does my client or company already have? Can mm -hmm. I use that as is or after modification and save some time and effort. We don't need to create recreate wheels right. if the company already has a bunch. So that that's that's the essence, I think, of what most people and most people in the business do not have to know how to do that. Mm -hmm. and a, a function of their leadership, the L and D leadership that they work for, who's not put in the processes and practices and taught their people how to do that. They just hire mm -hmm. people assuming that, yeah, you probably know how to do this right. and they don't think about analysis and the performance at the end of that. They think we need to train people on topic X, Y, and Z or Z and, and, you know, design something cool and fancy and, and use all the, you know, flashy media and all that stuff, which is, which is unfortunate, but that, but that, if this has been true since I, before I got into this, because the gurus of the business whined about this in 1979. Mm -hmm. They were, why are, why do people do, and they're still doing it today. So it's probably never going to end. <laughs> An advantage over others, because if you figure out how to do this and go into a new client or an organization, a new job, and you know how to do this, you'll differentiate yourself mm -hmm. because you do this and a lot of people aren't. Now, there's more approaches to this than just mine. Um, and so there's many, many different approaches on this, but the vast majority of the people in the business don't do analysis, don't do it well. Um, and they think that asking some questions is going to solve their answer. And they talk to a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. The research shows that this, the thinking that people do, experts do, performers do, is non-conscious. 70% of the, how they make decisions is unknown to the individual that makes those decisions. They can do the job. They can't tell you about it. Right. So it's tricky in that if you rely on one source of information, you're mm -hmm. going to have instruction that's incomplete. And, and so it's best to talk to multiple people. Mm -hmm. And then it just takes a, a forever and a day to talk to person A and then B and then C and figure out, oh, they said different things. Let me go back to A and tell them what B and C said and see if they agree. Mm -hmm. And then you also the semantical differences and such. And it's a struggle. So there's, you know, my approach that I talk about in the book is I bring together the experts in a room or, you know, online in a meeting and process them to get all this data out where they can talk about it and say, oh, you call it the, we call it the. Mm -hmm. so, well, yeah. And and but you'll run into all those kinds of issues. But learning analysis is critical. The other thing is project planning and management. Mm -hmm. Then that is stakeholder client management. Uh, how to deal with the request? How to take in the intake process for a request? Clarify the request. Understand what it is that they want. Um, and sometimes the requester doesn't really know. They think they need training on such and such, mm -hmm. or they don't really know. And if you push them for, well, what in the bit, what metrics will change if we do this? Sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. Right. And 
they'll make up an answer because their egos demand that they give you an answer. And, and then you lock in and that's not the right answer, but it was the one that you were given by the client, by the requester. And mm -hmm. so I warn people, ask if they've got that kind of information, but don't lock in until you've done the analysis because the analysis will tell you whether or not it's the uh, a time is the critical thing or cost or quality. So sometimes we get misled by our clients up front because we've pushed them, we pressure them to tell us, well, what's going to change in the business when we do this? And their egos will demand that they give us an answer mm -hmm. so they're foolish or like they don't know. Right. And, and so that's that's the other thing. So being able to develop a, a plan for how you're going to process, take the project and get it done. And either the company you go work for has a process, an addy like process, or SAM, or there's other variations, an agile process. Mm -hmm. And it's just a framing device for doing a project and getting from the beginning to the end. Right. And know where the middle is. Um, and so you'll need to take whatever you've learned before you get a job and figure out how to then exist within your company's process. Maybe they have one. Maybe they don't. If they don't, you should have your own. So that you right. plan and pro your projects and be somewhat predictable in terms of, well, how long is this going to take you? How much money are you going to spend? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, you don't ever, you always want to give a fuzzy answer. I always give answers like, you know, 20 plus or minus 10% or 15% or 20%. Mm -hmm. Because it's an educated guess. Right. Um, but you have some experience in a company to be able to do that, to know how easy or hard it is to work with people, to get people into meetings, you know, where they don't blow you off, where, yeah. you know, so all of that that enters into those things. But, right. but let me start at the very beginning. You need to learn how to do an intake process of some mm -hmm. where you get the request and you clarify that and you understand it well enough so that you can draft a project plan mm -hmm. and then, that with your client and make sure it's acceptable to them at the timing, the meetings, the people, the other resources, because you may have to do interviews, observations, uh -huh. document reviews, yeah. your approach to analysis, or you might assemble a team of people and, and get information from them, or mm -hmm. you might do all of that. Yeah. And, and so you de develop the draft plan, get that review with your client so that they commit because of a project plan is like a contract. It's a two-way agreement. You agree to do this. They agree to supply the people and the things and the make it help make it happen and mm -hmm. not just in your lap. So once you've got the project plan agreed to, then you can move forward with doing whatever you need to do for analysis. And then you want to take your analysis data and review it with the clients to make sure that they agree with it. There may be mm -hmm. who are violating the law and don't know it, but that's how they do it. And they're the experts. And, you know, so you need to not trust the data that you gather. Um, you need to trust your process. And if you gather data, you need to trust that you're going to get a chance to review that with others and they'll find any problems with it, any uh, sins of omission or, or sin, uh, just errors. Mm -hmm. And then you can take that into design and your, your, the companies you work with, my experience I've worked with, I have over 80 clients uh, going back since 1982. I've done multiple projects with them. I've worked with a whole bunch of their people. And most of the time, my clients do not have a design methodology. They don't say that we produce designs and there's these pieces to it. Um, so that, that's sometimes a challenge and an issue. You have to have one of your own or you have to adapt and use theirs. Mm -hmm. and getting into development and doing what used to be called developmental testing. You create a draft, you get it reviewed, you update it, you get it, you go and test it again and get it reviewed again. And, and then eventually your it kind of goes live for what I call a pilot test. Mm -hmm. People can you know, rip into it and fix whatever's broken before it goes live for the rest of the world, whoever that might be intended. Right. 
And so I think that that, so I, 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 what I wanted to do here was to kind of paint the picture of here's everything that's involved so that you could decide, oh, okay, I'm fine with that. This, I, I need to check out a little bit. We're all over the place. We talk about Addy as if that's the same for everybody. It's not. every If there's a thousand people doing Addy, there's 2,000 variations of it. Mm-hmm. So um, so that's what you have to be careful of as you're, you know, take everything that you can, learn from everybody, look at all the sources and begin to build your own model mm-hmm. uh, for how to do that. Because it's most likely wherever you get a job, they're not going to have one. Mm-hmm. They're Oh, you do Addy. Everyone, we all do Addy around here. Is it the same? And and it's not. It's it's more like a. It's less of an engineering approach than it is an artist colony where everybody uses colors. Yeah, everybody uses colors. Everybody uses brushes. Everybody uses, you know. So, so that that's that, and that can fool people when they go into this. They think that there is some commonly understood definitions of terms of of process of outputs, and there's not. Now you lucky and find some group that has a process and you're going to work in their process. And that's easier to learn because there's some baseline for you to, you know, grab onto. But, but I think you're right that, you know, once you get an understanding of what the performance goals are and what the knowledge goals are, Mm -hmm. then you develop things. So I would use the Addy framework and put planning on the front end of that, Mm -hmm. begin to mentally and physically begin to gather resources that fit that framework. There are resources out there for analysis. There's a bunch of tools, a bunch of flow charts, and all sorts Mm -hmm. of things. There's other things on project planning. Mm -hmm. Um, And in, and the intake process or dealing with requests or, you know, it's got the, all the, all the words to describe an intake process there's got to be a dozen of them. So that's yeah. what makes it hard and challenging. But I think if you just have a general feel for that, you know, if you get a, a job, you might be start off as a developer. When I had staff, I had up to 25 people on my staff. Uh, and I would bring people in that I thought were sharp and good writers, good, mm-hmm. they could, good developer. This was back in the, from 82 to 2002. And then I would train them on, um, using my templates for development. Mm-hmm. Then they would learn that and master that. And then I would see if they could be a designer and taking somebody else's analysis data and doing a design and then leading a development effort with a bunch of people doing it because divide and conquer. But then I would, after people master design, I would have them learn how to do the analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, because I always felt that you really didn't know how to do analysis until you appreciated really well what a designer does with that data mm-hmm. and then what the developers do with that data. So if you didn't have a clue about that, you couldn't really be a good analyst because the analyst has always got to be thinking about what's the performer supposed to be doing yes. and design and development do this. What information do I need to capture and document so yes. that they do their job without big holes in the information that they're working with? We need to be conscious of our design decisions that lead to development because it, video is expensive to produce and then to update if you're dealing with volatile content. If you're dealing with, so there's many factors that go into deciding, well, what mode and media do we use? Mm-hmm. There's the company always does, and they like it like that. Um but there's other ways inside the you know classroom training, face to face or virtual, that we can choose different media because if we're dealing with something that's volatile, we need to think about our life cycle costs and not the first cost. Mm, the first point. cost may it may be low, but it will be high if we have to update that all the time. It's much easier to update a, a, a PDF or a document on on the web than it is to update video because something changes mm-hmm. the nature of the content that it's going to contain. Less is better. Less content, more time practicing and getting feedback and shaping mm-hmm. the knowledge yeah. and skills. That's what's really critical. There's all sorts of great books out. There's contemporaries out here doing this work um, that, that 
have valuable things that they're sharing in books and in their sometimes they're they have videos of uh, that they've produced or others have produced and interviewed them and so there's a lot of good people out there today and almost all of them would be willing to answer some questions so these are the kind of people that you would want to build into your network Thank you.